You know, this morning, I'm going to share with you just on a topic briefly, because we all have Mother's Day plans. And if you don't have Mother's Day plans, make one. All right? That's your word. If you don't hear anything else today, make one. All right? You can be creative with, you know, with technology. That's all I'm going to say about that. I'm going to share with you on this topic briefly on it's called Energize, and I think that it's so important because sometimes in life we can feel beat down. It's so great that we're all celebrating moms, but I can tell you from my own mother, who's now resting in the arms of our Lord and Savior, one day I am so, well, I, I'm perpetually in awe of the influence she's had in my life. And I just want to say thank you, Lord, for the blessing you gave me for 40 years, 50 years of my life. And one of the things I remember I asked my mom once, and I was all ready for Mother's Day, and I said, Mom, you know, you know, usually you buy your mom something you think she wants. And I said, you know, let me flip the script. And I asked her, I said, Mom, what, what makes you feel loved? And I want to give that cue to someone. That don't always give your mom what you think she wants. Ask mom what she wants. And my mother told me something. She said, I like it when you speak softly. I said, what? I didn't know I was all loud like that. <laughs> she said, I, and she gave me all the little things that meant the world to her that never even crossed my mind. So I said, well, I got to put away some of the things I was going to buy and at least for one day adjust some of the things that I'm going to do. And, you know, and, and this morning, you know, when you look at your spiritual life, we need to have that same conversation with God. God, what are some things that you like? Instead of me approaching you saying, I think this is what you want me to do, say, Lord, what is it that gives you honor? What is it that gives you delight? And I'm going to share just this topic with you. This comes out of the book of 1 Peter chapter 2. But in my heart, I'm going to read to you a few of the verses that came out to me right, in the, right uh, during worship. It comes out of 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3 to 9. I'm just going to read it to you. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. That means God has begotten us again, given us life, to a living hope. Someone say with me, a living hope. Say it again nice and loud, a living hope. You know, what does a living hope mean? It means a hope that doesn't die. You know, some of us, we had hope. We remember a moment where we had hope and then we gave up hope. But Peter's talking about saying, our hope needs to stay alive. Always believing, hallelujah, that God's going to do something. Always trusting that no matter what we're in, God has an answer for it and that God has a solution for it. So we should always have a, an alive hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And I looked at this verse in verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Every person who's in Christ has an incorruptible inheritance. Oh, I'm going to say that again. It means something you haven't seen all of yet, that no problem, no trouble, no distress, no challenge can ever diminish, fade, or tarnish. It's reserved for you. You haven't seen it yet. You've gotten a foretaste. But Peter is saying that there's an inheritance for you. Oh, someone's going to hear me this morning. Incorruptible, undefiled, doesn't fade away. Verse 5, who are kept by the power of God. Make this declaration with me. Say, God is keeping me. Now say with me, God is keeping us. Hallelujah. Oh, my Lord. Who are kept by the power of God. How? Through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In verse 6, in this you greatly rejoice. Do we have any rejoicing believers in here this morning? Any rejoicing moms? Any people who say, I can give God praise anytime, anywhere. It doesn't matter what the weather is, how I feel. I can thank the Lord. Go ahead and thank the Lord right now. I can thank him anywhere, anytime, any moment, and in any situation. It's not responding to how I feel. It's based on who I am. It says, in this you greatly rejoice. And look at this phrase, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. So Peter is telling this group of peoples, you're rejoicing even though you've been going through some stuff. 
Do we have any people here you could say, Pastor, I've gone through my fair share of trials? Anyone in here? Okay, can I speak to all the moms? Any moms in here, you love your kids, you love your family, but you remember some battles you had to fight? Anyone? Any fathers? Anyone in here? My Lord. So Peter's saying, you've been grieved, you've had your trials, but yet you're rejoicing. Verse 7, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That scripture right there, it gives you the whole backdrop to the book of 1 Peter. Peter was writing to a group of believers, and he said, you've been going through a lot, you've had some serious trials, you've taken some gut punches, you've had those moments where you said, Lord, I don't even know what's going to happen, but in the midst of it, you were still praising God, you were still rejoicing God, and he said, I'm coming to remind you that even though you're going through something, this isn't the end, that there's a better end for you, there's an inheritance that's out there, and it outperforms anything you can see, dream, or imagine. It's incorruptible. It doesn't matter what you've gone through, it will not tarnish what God has for you. And he's saying it will not fade. So then when we look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, I want you just to look with me briefly at these phrases. In the first verse it says, Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking. Let's all say those words together. Say with me, malice, malice deceit, deceit, hypocrisy, hypocrisy envy, envy, and all evil speaking. And all evil. See, those five things. He said, Peter, saying you're going through some things. Yeah. There's an inheritance for you, but there's some things as you're going through them, you've got to lay aside. Oh, my Lord. Some people will say, you got to forgive me, but I'm going through something today. Anyone ever heard that? And they think that that gives them the liberty to do certain things, speak certain ways, harbor certain feelings, because I'm going through something. Well, what Peter's saying is even though you're going through something, there's some things in our nature you have to lay aside. Oh, my Lord. I don't like hearing that, Lisa. There's some things you have to lay aside. No, I'm just kidding. Not us. <laughs> She's going to say you. No, I'm just kidding. But... And so what Peter does is he identifies five things. You know, in, this, in the past few weeks, six weeks, we had a session here with a brother named Brother Bristol, and he was working some of the men out for six weeks. I want to say thank you to Bristol. And he was giving us all of these things. Amen. He taught us about nutrition. And, and one of the things that he explained to us in nutrition is you have to make a deal with yourself and you've got to make some non-negotiables with yourself, and whatever you put in your body, your body will respond to, and it will dictate a lot of your future. So he got with us about our diet. Ouch. Like talking about diet. I just want to praise God and, and preach. I don't want to have to watch what I eat and count calories and proteins and carbs. And, but you have to is what he did, and he, he instructed us. And when you look at this scripture, I want you to see these words as the things you should not have in a spiritual diet. He says one of those things is you've got to lay aside malice. But malice is poor moral character that leads to inactions. Have you ever seen a person that says, since what you did to me, I know exactly what I'm going to do to you. I'm going to get you back. Whatever you did to me, you know, it's, it's, I, I have the right to get you back. It's even the intention. Have you ever said, I'm not going to do something, but I'm going to sure think about it. Well, someone in here is not going to talk to me this morning. Has anyone gotten you ever so upset that you found joy in just meditating on what you're going to do to them, even though you know you're not going to do it, and said, man, I would do this and say that, and I would not do this and not do that, and I'm going to walk right on by them, and, and you know, you got all this joy, even though you're not doing it, but where is it? It's in your mind, and it's in your heart. And so what Peter is saying is when you're going through your trials, you got to lay that aside. You can't put that in your spiritual diet and think that it won't come out or that some causes won't come from it. The second thing he says is deceit. Don't have this in your diet. Take it out. What is deceit? Deceit is when you don't share information or when you share 
enough information, but not all of the information, so that you can steer a person into doing what you want them to do. Well, let me say that again. It's when you either don't say the truth or you give enough pieces of the truth to control a person's actions to get, you're being deceitful. How many people here know what I'm talking about? Oh, Lord, my God. We got to lay that aside. What's the opposite of deceit? Being honest, open, having integrity. That's what we put in our diet. Hypocrisy. The Greek word literally means to pretend. Pretending to be someone that you're not. I'm saved, I walk with Christ and all the rest, but my life reflects something completely different than what I'm purporting to be. I'm playing a role. Oh, someone help me this morning. We got to lay that aside. That can't go into our spiritual diet. Envy. You know what envy really means? It means being emotionally hurt at seeing someone excelling. It's when I see someone thriving and striving and getting promoting, and every time I see them thriving, I get hurt. Something hurts me. Why isn't that me? When is it my turn? I, don't, I, I wish that would happen to me and not them. That's envy. The opposite of envy is divine contentment and joy and knowing that what God has for me is for me and I'll take delight in it. And all evil speaking. So Peter says you've got to lay all of those things aside. You see, spiritual growth requires that you move away from and reject certain mindsets, attitudes, and behaviors. One of the things I want to leave you this morning with, know what to accept and know what to reject. Amen. Know what things you can receive and know what things you have to say, this doesn't belong in my life. Amen. Some of it is internally generated and some of it is externally influenced. When you see someone around you speaking evil, speaking malicious thoughts, living a life that's different, I want you to recognize that influence may not be working for you. Amen. Any witnesses in here? Oh, the whole church went quiet on it. Either speak to it, amen, and correct it. And if you can't speak to it and correct it, then remove yourself from the environment. But don't let it in. Can the church say amen to that this morning? Oh, Lord, my Lord. Now, look at this. He says, as newborn babes. Now, look at this metaphor. Desire what? The pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. When you think of this metaphor, Peter is likening the Christian uh, believer's walk through trials to get through to an inheritance as a person who was being born and they have to eat all the right nutrients and get all the right things in them so that they can go through all the different challenges of life and get to the, to get to the end. Let me give you a physical. Sometimes in my life, not sometimes, what I'm going through right now is, is a health restoration where I have to now dedicate myself personally to some new health habits. I'm, I'm being transparent with you this morning. Why? Because when you live your life and you take in the wrong things in perpetuity, all of a sudden sickness can come in. Illnesses can come in. Your life, your, your, your life experience can become diminished because you haven't had the right nutrients, minerals, and vitamins inside you. Someone's going to hear me in a moment. Well, the same way that's true physically, it's true spiritually. Peter's saying the way you get through your trials is you've got to be immunized. You've got to be clean. You've got to be strong. You have to be spiritually healthy. You have to be whole. So the way you get through these trials is by rejecting some things all along and knowing what things you should receive so that when the trial comes, you can withstand it. Oh, someone's going to hear me in a moment. And he says, what you have to desire is something that's pure. Oh, Jesus. And pure here, that word milk, it just doesn't mean a baby. It means that in a mother's milk is the nutrients a baby needs. That what she has, the child can receive. And when that trial has that milk, in its first few months, in its first stages of life, it prepares that child for things to come. Oh, someone's going to hear me in a moment. And what he's saying is in the same way a baby sees their mother as the one who provides for all my nutrients, he says, spiritually, you need to look at God's word that way. That when I reject certain things and I go to God's word, it's going to give me all that I need for the challenges in my life. 
And so he said, the newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word. Why? That you can grow. Oh, someone's going to hear me. See, my mother once told me, she gave a metaphor when she was preaching the scripture. She said, when a baby is born and you carry the baby and you give the baby milk and you change the baby and you carry the baby, she said, that's real cute. But she said, but when that baby turns 21, you shouldn't be giving milk, changing. That, that ain't cute no more. Well, someone's going to hear me in a moment. It's cute for a season. But what's the expectation that you will grow and develop and get to some level of autonomy and independence, all right? And what this scripture is saying is that you need God's milk because God intends for you to spiritually grow. The challenge is there's a lot of people, oh my Lord, that are in arrested spiritual development. Man, the same problem that hits me 30 years after I gave my life to Christ still makes me fall the same way I did on day one. But I want to tell you today that the kingdom of God is alive. God's word will grow you. God's word will develop you so that the things that made you fall before will not make you fall later. And that every day God wants you to grow and grow and grow and increase and increase as you bring in the right things of the word and the right things of his nature and the right things of his spirit. So he says, newborn babes desire the poor milk that you may grow if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Oh, Jesus. Cultivate a love for receiving, understanding, and applying God's word to your life because this is your best path to thrive. What this scripture is saying is, if you've tasted the Lord, then you like what you've tasted. And the same way a baby knows I can go right to the mother, that's the milk that I want. I had a son when he was, he's actually right here in front of me. I love you, John. I'm going to talk about you nonetheless. And when John was a baby, he was, out of my three sons, he was kind of a no-nonsense baby. And, and when you gave him milk and, and he got towards the end of the bottle, <laughs> if, 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 when he felt like he couldn't get, he would fill the bottle. You know, all the other babies, yeah, yeah, yeah. John's like, oh, no. you throw the bottle. You, you see a little kid with all this rage. All the, oh, no. You know, and, and, and why? Because he craved what he had. And when we go to the Lord, we should crave the Lord. Oh, Jesus. If you, you know, come everyone, taste and see that the Lord, he is good, my Lord. And this scripture said, if you have indeed tasted the Lord is gracious, then desire the pure milk. I want more of God. Lord, I want more of you. I want to be with you in the morning, in the noon, in the evening. I want to worship with you. I want to, I want to receive from you. I want to be in your presence. And the longer that I'm there, the more that I want to go back, my Lord. Something's missing when I'm not in God's presence, my Lord. And my entire day goes differently. So it says, once you've tasted, continue to desire. Now I'm just going to close with this last scripture. It's in verse 4, because you see Peter, he says, remember again, if you're going to get through these trials to get all the way to that inheritance, you've got to make sure you're accepting and rejecting the wrong stuff in your spiritual diet, right? And the second thing is we have to continue to desire God's word. But then he shifts. And in verse 4, he stops comparing our spiritual walk to a mother and a child. And he says, coming to him, that means going to Jesus, as to a living stone. Someone say with me, a living stone. Oh, Jesus, Jesus. Before we talk about a living hope, now we're talking about a living stone. Coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. In the first few verses, he likened our walk to a baby and a mom. And then he talks about how we should be desiring God's word. But once he shifts from desiring God's word, he shifts from a baby and a mom to a builder who's building a building. And he says, you know what, when you go to the Lord, in the same way that a baby is seeking its mom, you're going to him as a living stone. Hmm. 
You, you see, when you look at every building you're in, every road that you drove on here, every bridge that you've crossed, and you go beyond all those structures, and you go underground, and you get into that foundation, and you look at what's under the foundation, you know what you'll find? Stones. Oh, Jesus. Tested, true, designed by diameter and by nature so that they can support all the pressure of the soil and the pressure of everything that comes under it. So Peter said that, you know what, you need to look at your life and look at this world, that everything is resting on something else. Oh, Jesus. Oh, my God. Do you feel like everyone is resting on you in your life? Oh, Jesus. And he says that in your life, you have a stone. Oh, Jesus. And that stone is Jesus. Oh, Lord. God. He says, when you go to the Lord, and seek the pure milk of his word. Realize you're going to your stone, Jesus, the one who will support you and strengthen you and who's alive. He didn't say the one who was. He's saying he's a living stone. What strength do you need today? Jesus has it. What needs do you need the Lord to carry for you? God has it. Never say the words, I can't make it through this because your life rests on Jesus, my Lord. And in the same way a bridge or a building can't collapse because of what's underneath the soil, your life can't fail nor collapse if it rests on Jesus. So Jesus is the stone. But you know, in engineering and in construction, when you're doing a building, the most important stone is the first stone. I've been part of many of those building projects. You'll have maybe dozens of guys who are there, masonry workers who have all the foundation blocks. And they were all different degrees and trade levels, but they always bring the experts in to set the first stone. You'll see those guys put down that masonry block. Sometimes you'll see them get a nail, and they'll put the head of a nail on one corner of that block. Then they use what's called GPS, Global Positioning Satellite, just to find out the longitude and the latitude of the corner of that block. You know why? Because they know that based upon that one block you set, every other block has to set on that block. So if that first block is a little bit off, instead of being straight, it's skewed, just a hair. And you take the next block and you put it on, it becomes more and more skewed. So if you got to build a 1,000 foot building, if the first block is off, by the time you get to the end, the whole world will say, this building is not square, it's a trapezoid, it's at all these angles. So what they do is they measure each of those corners. They get it right, they set the levels, make sure it's perfectly level, because other stones have to be on it. it. Has the perfect bearing, it goes right on its property. And they'll go for that one stone, and sometimes it may take, you know, within 45 minutes to an hour just to set one stone. If you were to look at it, it would seem frustrating to you. you say, we got a lot to build, and you have all these pros doing one stone. Then they'll go to another corner of the building, and they'll do the same thing. And they do that for all four corners. And then you know what they do after that? They'll look at the head of each of those nails, and they'll tie a thread, a line a line that goes from nail head to nail head, nail head to nail head, nail head, and they'll make one square. And after all the pros are done, then they call in all the journeymen. And they say, just grab a block, grab the masonry, go one block, but stay on line. Oh, Jesus. Why? Because the cornerstones have been set. And once they're set, now it's easier for anyone else to be right in alignment with that set or with that stone. Peter used, hallelujah, that metaphor to describe the importance of making sure your life rests exactly on Jesus. Because Jesus has already set who we are, hallelujah. He's already set where we're going, hallelujah. He's already set the fact that we're forgiven. He's already set and established that he's going to prepare a place for us that we can't even think of or dream. He's already set that we are more than conquerors. So what we have to now do is make sure that our lives are in perfect alignment with what Jesus has said. 
And if we seek his word, then we're in perfect alignment. When we say, I'm going to do half of the word, I become a block that's skewed. But when I'm a block that's in perfect alignment, I have his strength, his support, and the spiritual house that he's building will be strong and fortified. Do you receive that this morning, church? So I'm going to say to all the mothers, to all the family members, there's a lot of people counting on you, but don't forget who your stone is. If you're set on the cornerstone, then every other stone that's connected to you will be right. Don't be partial with your walk. Don't allow the things in your life that only harm you. As a mom, as a father, as a believer, you're allowed to say, hey, I hear what you're saying, but I can't be here right now to hear that. It's not doing well for me. So I'll pray for you, but this isn't my environment right now. Be selective and judicious about the words you allow in your soul. You're allowed to do that, amen? Oh, Jesus, Jesus. My Lord, my Lord. And allow yourself to take in those things that are pleasant, those things that are righteous, those things that are pure, those things that align with what God has told you in your spirit and who the Lord has declared you to be. And allow yourself to go through every trial as a person who's strong enough to go through it because you know the foundation in whom you rest. Do you receive that word this morning, church? Can you thank the Lord with me just this morning? My Lord, my Lord. My Lord. You know, one of the words phrases that he describes in that scripture, he says, for you are a royal priesthood. He says that in the latter parts of 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, a royal denotes regalness, kingship, queenship. Priesthood is a different role. He said, you're both. You're kings and priests all together. That's the walk that the Lord has called us to be. I want to encourage you, it doesn't matter what you're going through, you'll make it through it if your life rests on Jesus. I'm gonna encourage you today that don't let your salvation slip, don't allow your faith to wane. Just know that you have the incorruptible seed of God inside you, something that this world can't touch. And walk in faith, walk in the Spirit of God, and walk knowing I will make it through this as I continue to have the right spiritual diet. I'm just gonna invite everyone just to stand with me to your feet. We're going to just have a moment of prayer. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. You know, there's some things in life that's called a detox. <laughs> some of us, we may need a spiritual detox based on some things that came into our life that we're going to let go of right now so that we can be strong in the name of Jesus. If someone's hurt you, we're going to purge that out of you in the name of Jesus. Oh, Lord. If at some moment in your life you've thought, my life will never be in the future what it could be based on what's happened to me in my past, we're going to purge that out of you this morning in the name of Jesus so that you can blossom and thrive and walk with God in the fullness of your strength and in the fullness of his calling. Just bow your heads with me, Lord, in the name of Jesus. You see all these, your sons and your daughters, gathered in your presence today. First, Lord, we say thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you for sending us your son, Jesus, who died for us, to wash us, cleanse us, and remove from us all sin. First, we say thank you, Jesus, for being our Savior and our Lord. And we acknowledge you in the fullness of your kingship, the fullness of your reigning, and we invite you to come and rule and reign over our lives, our hearts, and our families in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we declare and we decree that every word that was expelled or sent out to any person in here to hurt, to wound, to be malicious, or that was envious of, we rebuke it now in the name of Jesus. We rebuke it now in the name of Jesus. We drive it out in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That every response to that word may be renewed, restored, and revived based on the word that God has spoken, that you are fearfully and wonderful made. 
that you are born again, that you are born of incorruptible seed, that you are a son and a daughter of the Most High God. We say, yes, Lord, to the work you're doing in us. Yes, Lord, to the call you've extended to us. Yes, Lord, for the righteousness we have based on you. And Lord, today, we release every negative thing that's in our spirits that's trying to destroy us. And we say thank you, Lord, for every pure thing that your word is now bringing in. So we speak healing. We speak a word of wholeness. We speak a word of joy. Hallelujah, hallelujah. A word of joy, a word of praise, that where there was sorrow, there will now be joy in the name of Jesus. Where there has been pain, there will now be praise in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, for removing and refilling us with your spirit, Lord God. We give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church says, amen and amen. I want you to give the Lord a shout of praise this morning. Hallelujah. Can you say with me, thank you, Lord, nice and loud. Say, thank you, Lord, for what you've done in my life. Hallelujah. Say, thank you, Lord, for where I'm going in my life. Now give him a loud shout of praise right now. Praise your way for what, praise your way for what he's done. God's presence is with you today. And I have a special prayer with every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're in the house this morning and you're saying, you know, Pastor, I hear everything you're saying, but I need to make sure my life rests on the cornerstone. I don't know Jesus as well as I should. Or maybe you're saying, I don't know Jesus at all. I want to start now. That's the best decision that you can make. And I'm going to invite you, if that's you right now, I'm going to pray for you right where you are in your seat. All you have to do is raise your hand and just say, Pastor, will you pray with me that I might give my life to Jesus Christ, that I might accept him as my Lord and Savior. Just raise your hand right where you are. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I want to accept him as my Lord and Savior. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. And to everyone that's made that decision of the declaration, you just raise your hand and say, thank you, Lord, thank for you, what Lord. you've done for me in my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah Lord Jesus. I think I see you. I thought I saw a hand. Is my sister's hand up right in the back row? Yes. There is a hand that's raised. All right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm sorry. Right where you are. I don't want to rush you. Hallelujah. We do have a hand. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to lead you in a prayer right where you are, sis. And you can repeat these words after me. And if you've already given your life to the Lord, you can also say this along with our sister just to strengthen her. And just say with me, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus today, today, I accept you, I accept you as, my Savior as my Savior and as my Lord. And as my Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. For dying for, me, for dying for me, for being my price, being my price for every one of my mistakes. One of my mistakes. I, accept I accept your life, your life as my price. My price. Thank, you, Thank you, Jesus, for cleansing me, for, cleansing for, washing, me, me, for washing me, and for purifying me. And for purifying me. Because, you are my Savior, because you are my Savior, I say today, I say today you are my Lord. I will follow you for the rest of my life. Jesus, you're my Savior. Jesus, you're my Lord. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And I say amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a shout of praise this morning. Amen. Oh, thank you, sister. Hallelujah, hallelujah. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. And after service, we have some ministers that are going to speak with you and take you through the next steps. Hallelujah. Church, before I actually transition, I'm going to ask for your prayer. I'm going to ask my wife, Lady Lisa, if she can come and just join me by my side. We like to share everything with the church first, and we want to give you some just short-term news, nothing too serious. But next uh, Sunday, May 19th, I'll be flying to Ethiopia for two weeks, two weeks, amen, amen. There is a crusade that is breaking out in Ethiopia where they're seeing thousands of people give their lives to the Lord at every single occurrence. 
with hundreds of pastors being born right out of that movement. So I was asked with 10 other pastors from the United States to fly over. They're gonna fly us over. We're gonna be there for 14 days. They've asked me to preach in the Crusades and to also be part of the teaching team for the new pastors being born. Amen. Hallelujah. So, I'm gonna ask for your prayer. Can you pray for my wife as I'm gone and stand by her side? My sons are home, glory be to God. I'm also gonna ask that you pray for Ethiopia, for the people that God's calling and for the Christianity that's being born right out of that country. It's precious to watch. And pray for the safe travel and health of all of the pastors that are going. Can you do that with me? Amen, church. So I'll see you next Sunday, and then I'll see you a few weeks after that. I love you, all right? God bless you. Praise God. Praise God. One sec. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just before Pastor Arbor, before you leave, since he's going to be here today, why don't we pray for you right now? Where's Pastor Minus? Pastor Mike, come right on up. Hallelujah. Let's pray for Pastor Arbor, right? Matter of fact, one, since you want me to come right down here, Pastor Minus, can you? Stretch your hands out to uh, Pastor Arbor as we unite our hearts in prayer and faith to the living God. Father, we come at this moment, Lord, knowing that you are the author and the finisher of our faith, the one who opens and closes doors, the one who empowers by your spirit and has written upon the hearts of those who have been called by your name to proclaim your gospel. So, Father, this morning we pray a covering over Pastor Fenton, and the rest of the team as they prepare to go to Ethiopia. Father, we pray that you would go before them, that your ministering angels would be ever present to hearken to the word of faith that proceeds out of all of those who will proclaim your gospel. We pray, Lord God, your divine protection guard their minds, their spirits, and their bodies. We declare no weapon formed against them shall prosper. We pray an anointing that they will break the yokes and set the captives free. Yes. We release the anointing power of your spirit for their healing virtue to flow as words of faith and prayers of healing are ushered through their lips. That the lame will walk, the blind will see, the deaf will hear, and those who are lost will be drawn in by the power of your spirit to the saving grace and power of your word. We thank you, Father, for the harvest that shall be seen and recognized to the obedience of their faith unto you. So, Father, Lord, we commit them to your hands. Thank you in advance for the work you shall do, and we shall be ever rejoicing as we cover them during this time. In the master's name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray, and the church says amen, amen, and amen. So let it be.